everyone. I'm Brett Finley from One Group's construction team here today in conjunction with the Syracuse Builders Exchange, a very valued teammate of ours. Uh, I'm with colleague Paul Kader, at least virtually, our Vice President of Risk Management Services, to provide some guidance over the next half an hour or so on a very important topic. Now, in conversations with Earl, Earl Hall, um, we both came to the conclusion that we're hearing a lot of similar questions from the contractors that we serve. And with everyone's eyes focused on getting started again or back up to speed, the question is, how do I do this? How am I supposed to run a safe job site? How do I protect my employees? Are there any OSHA requirements? Do I need a COVID-19 specific safety plan? The answers, well, they can be complicated. And for the most part, it's uncharted territory, right? I mean, we haven't really been through something quite like this before. But with all of that being said, we're going to spend this time on one of the most consistent questions that we've received. And that is, how do I build a COVID-19 safety program? And we have sent along material through Earl to the membership via email for you to reference throughout this webinar. So at this time, I'm going to give you to Paul Kader, a much smarter individual than me, to provide the necessary guidance. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Brett. Thanks very much. Um, so we're here today to talk about how COVID-19 impacts our activities on a job site. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to review an outline of a job site safety program as it relates specifically to COVID-19. Now, this is just a template. Uh, it's not a done and done deal relative to a safety program for your jobs because your jobs are going to be slightly different from every other job. So I very much recommend that you take a look at the safety plan that's in the handouts and you look at our outline, you listen to our discussion today and think about how you would apply this plan to your operations, your specific operations and make changes to it. Build your own safety plan so that it deals with how you do work. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump in and we're just going to go through the basic elements of the safety program itself related to COVID-19. And keep in mind, this would be in addition to that safety program or plan that you have uh, governing the rest of your operations as far as how you do things. So what we want to do is jump in. The introduction part of this is just uh, why we're doing this, why we're implementing a COVID-specific safety program. And that really, that takes twofold. Number one, we want to protect our employees and the employees of subs and others around us uh, so that we can get jobs done. If you look at the research out there right now on COVID-19, you can see that, yeah, it, it is a very, very virulent uh, substance that, that can cause the, the uh, illness among people with kind of minimal exposure, you know, a few breaths or whatever the case is. So when we start looking at this, it's not something that, that we can just take lightly. If you run into a situation of an individual on your job site who is packed into other people doing work on your job site, or maybe in a job trailer, or maybe uh, traveling with folks, whatever the case might be, and you start spreading the virus among your staff, then what's going to happen is you're going to lose people very quickly and for quite a bit of time. It's not a three-day cold. It's at least a two-week and sometimes two-month, three-month process. So we don't want to have this virus spread through our workforce on our job sites because it's going to do nothing but cause havoc. So we, that's the primary reason that we do this. Uh, secondary reason is some of the other contractors, some of the GC, some of the owners, are mandating that you have a COVID-specific safety program in order to do work on their site. And this will meet most of their needs. You'll have to look at the job specs to make sure it meets all of their needs and adjust it if needed. So let's jump into the, the elements of this safety program. And the elements that we're going to be dealing with are things like having a policy statement. Um, you know, any type of program like this is a human resource program and in order to be enforceable and defendable if you should end up in court, you have to have a policy of some kind. So you want to make sure that there's a written policy on what you're doing and we'll get into that a little bit. So we have policy statement, responsibilities, the general safety rules that are COVID related, job specific safety rules adapting the rules to specific job demands, controlling site entry, personal protective equipment and work practices, cleaning and disinfecting of the job site, resp response to exposures or potential exposures, OSHA record keeping, and privacy and information. 
those are the key elements of a general safety program related to COVID. And now let's jump into each one and, and talk about them. So if we look at the policy statement aspect, uh, this is actually a declaration of your intent of what you're trying to do with this COVID safety program. You're trying to protect workers, you're trying to protect others. Um, so you want to state that uh, and have the president of the company, CEO, whoever a high ranking executive in your organization, highest ranking executive is, to sign that and say, hey, this is what we're trying to do with this thing. This is how we're going to go about it. It establishes the base game, the base rules of the game. The next thing are operational controls. Um, so if we look into, we get the policy statement written, we have to think about how we're going to do work on a given job site. And we look at, uh, are we going to stagger shifts? Are we going to split teams? How are we going to maintain this distancing thing that we talk about every day? Uh, what are we going to do within our operations and our schedules to try and maintain distancing, to maintain the, the sanitary conditions and the hygiene conditions so that we don't spread any kind of disease? Keep in mind that when folks are on your job site, you may be very confident that they are not infected. However, those folks go home at night and they're exposed to their families who may be going out into the workplace, may be going out into social environments, who may not be adhering to the distancing rules and whatnot. So it's very easy for the virus to be contracted by a family member, brought home, spread, and then brought to your work site. And when we're talking about the spread, you have to remember also that in the first two weeks of gestation of this virus, when people are asymptomatic, they're not showing any symptoms, that period just before they start showing symptoms is when they're most contagious in spreading the virus. So you may not know that the individual is infected at that point, and you bring him into your work site and he's spreading the germs. So you wanna maintain those hygiene and distancing controls across the job in order to keep people working. So now let's jump into the, the key elements of the safety program, defining responsibilities. It's, it's very easy for us to say we want to maintain distancing and whatnot. We want to um, possibly be wearing masks, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we want to uh, encourage hand washing and whatnot, but we have to define that within our, our company, and we have to give specific responsibilities out. People are not just going to naturally do these things. It's a change to behavior. So somebody's going to have to look at it, support it, reinforce it, and whatnot. And that's your managers and supervisors. Define those responsibilities very clearly for them, and talk to them about it, train them in it, and hold them to that. Next are defining the employee responsibilities, what you expect the employees to do relative to COVID-19. You want to tell them about that, you want to write them down, give them a copy of that, and then you can hold them to that and reinforce this change in behavior that we're asking for. Those are key elements because if you don't define the behaviors that you want and the responsibilities, you really can't hold people to it very effectively. So defining responsibilities is a key element of this safety program. The next thing is general safety rules. We've got the general safety rules across our job sites of wear safety glasses when you're doing cutting and grinding. We've got general safety rules of wear um, boots when you're on the job site and things like that, a hard hat when there's overhead exposures. Um, but now we have to look at COVID specific general safety rules. Things like if you're, if you're sick, if you have symptoms, stay home. Don't bring that into us. If you feel sick on the job site, go home don't stay and spread those germs. We have a culture that, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, all, I'm part of it, that if you felt a little sick, if you had the sniffles, if you had a headache, if you had the flu, if you were missing a leg or an arm, you'd drag yourself into work and you'd get your job done on any given day. Well, we've got to change that behavior with this COVID stuff because of the way it spreads. So you've got to get the message across to your employees, if you're sick, stay home, if you feel ill, go home. Don't have contact with people. Other things in general safety rules, such as meetings. Um, you don't have meetings in the job trailer anymore. You don't bring in five, six, seven, eight people. You don't have the, the toolbox talks in the job trailer anymore. You don't gather in a group on the job site tight together because you can't hear very well because you can't, because that's how you spread this disease. 
if you're going to have meetings, if you're going to do things like that, you might want to do them off hours. If you're doing a safety meeting, do them off hours and get people on the phone to do it. Um, if you're going to have a meeting on the job site, then you maintain distancing and you might put masks on everybody. So think about those things and how you're going to maintain distancing when you're having meetings and whatnot. Breaks and lunch. What are you going to do about where people eat and where people have their breaks, where the people have their lunches? And this could be, you know, a lot of times it might have gone back to the job trailer. You might have gone back to a given area where everybody got together and had their lunch. Think about the distancing requirements in there. Think about the hygiene requirements for that. Um, and think about the, some jobs I know guys go out to their truck and they'll jump in the truck with somebody else and have their job. Well, there's probably nothing worse than getting into a car or a vehicle with somebody who's potentially infected with COVID because every breath they're taking, you're inhaling when they're done with it. And that's where you catch the virus. So think about things like that. Think also about ride sharing. Um, a lot of times you'll have guys either meet at the shop and drive out to the job together or come to the job together from home to pick other people up on the way. Not a good practice. If you could avoid it, avoid it. Because again, you're sticking two people or three people, four people into a vehicle, just sharing each other's air and everything they're inhaling and exhaling. Next, we want to look at job specific safety rules that are COVID related. Um, and this is, this is going to be very, and I'm not going to give you all the rules on this because it, I, like it says, it's job specific. You have to evaluate the job and think about are there distancing problems? Are there hygiene problems? What's going on on this job that I have to think about in re relation to COVID-19? But some of the things that might spark interest would be things like entering occupied buildings. If you're doing work in a building that there's already people in, what are you walking into? Are there, are there controls in place in that building? Um, are there controls that they want you to adhere to before coming into that building? So you need to prep for the job. Um, what kind of space are you going into? Is it a tight space? Is it wide open space? Is, uh, are the windows open? Or are there any windows in the building at the time? All these things have an impact on the likelihood of sharing this virus. So take a look at, from a job specific safety standpoint, uh, what you're sending your folks into. Also look at things like visitors, subcontractors, and whatnot coming into your job site. Uh, I'm a safety person, uh, worked for an insurance company for a whole bunch of years, and I used to go to job sites all the time. This is probably not the time you want somebody coming out to look at your job site because you don't know what that visitor, vendor, subcontractor, or whatever is bringing in with them and you don't want somebody coming in and infecting your team. If you have to receive somebody, then maybe you want to establish some form of screening process or you want to establish some sort of rules for them when they come onto the site. So if you're having a visitor, you may say, yes, okay, we need you to come on this site because we need you to do whatever. Uh, but we want you to, if possible, answer these questions for us about whether you've had a fever, about whether you felt ill, et cetera. Uh, if you've answered yes to any of those questions, then we're going to have to delay this or we're going to have to get somebody else to come on site. When you come on site, we're going to ask you to put on a mask or wear a mask coming in site. And we're going to ask you to keep that on at all times when you're on our site. Be very jealous about what people bring and share uh, because it's, it's very important. And speaking about bringing and sharing, think about uh, if you do have anybody that tends to come on site and bring and share a plate of cookies or um, you know, a case of iced tea or whatever the case might be, um, you don't want to share anything on site anymore. Not right now. Uh, if people are bringing stuff in, then you can either tell them to go put it back in their truck or just put it right in the trash on the way through because we're not going to be uh, sharing that kind of thing. So think about those job-specific um, procedures. Then we think about site entry procedures in general. Um, when we talk about site entry procedures, we're again talking about visitors, subs, deliveries, and things like that. Uh, you want to post and you want to notify your delivery companies that there will be no unnecessary visitors on our site and we will be implementing screening procedures for all visitors coming on site. And to make your life easier, I would recommend doing some sort of uh, written screen when people do come on site because if in fact 
you do end up having an outbreak or maybe one of your uh, neighboring contractors has an outbreak that that delivery guy went to earlier in the day, you will be involved in that tracing process. And having that sign-in sheet and notification sheet and talk about whether or not this individual passed the screen um, will be helpful when the, the tracing uh, investigators come to you and say, hey, we understand this person came to your job today. Did you do any screening? Did you allow them on site, et cetera? So keep records of that. So maintain a tight site. Don't let people onto it. Don't let people in and out unless you absolutely have to. Let's get down now to personal protective equipment. Um, when we talk about personal protective equipment, we've already probably got hard hats, boots, uh, possibly gloves, safety glasses, and things like that on the site. What we now want to kick over to is the COVID-related personal protective equipment. And, you know, when we start talking about things like this, what we jump to immediately is face coverings. So the governor has issued the order that unless you can maintain a six-foot distance from people, then you should be wearing a face covering. This goes true on a job site also. And I can understand that wearing a face covering um, it can be very uncomfortable, particularly right now we're, we're in the, the heart of spring and we're having 30 degree temperatures and that makes it a little less uncomfortable. But once we start getting up into the 70s and 80s, wearing anything on your face and breathing through the course of the day is going to be uncomfortable. They're going to get sweaty. They're going to get dirty. Um, so you might want to look at how many uh, face coverings do we have to have for our staff on site? How many face coverings do we have to have for any kind of delivery people or uh, vendors or whatever the case is that are coming on the site? Um, so make sure you have adequate supply of personal protective equipment. Again, you're, you're not thinking that, oh, crap, we've got to put in the personal protective equipment program. People got to wear these foolish masks. You're thinking about how do I keep my guys on the job? Because if COVID-19 hits your job site and spreads, it, it goes through very, very quickly and it'll take a bunch of people down with it. So you wanna make sure that you look at what um, type of personal protective equipment you have to have. Now there's a lot of information out there recommending the use of gloves. Um, and, and with COVID-19, the use of gloves can be important in very specific times. However, if people are wearing gloves through the course of the day, and by gloves I'm meaning the latex gloves or rubber gloves or things like that that you'd normally see and you associate with things like infections and bacteria and whatnot. The key thing to remember about COVID-19 is it enters through the mouth and through the nose. So if you give somebody a pair of gloves that they're gonna wear all day long, the key issue is that they're still going to be touching their face, their mouth, and their nose through the course of the day, whether they have gloves on or not. There's no route of entry through the skin and through the hands. So the gloves aren't protecting that individual through the, through the skin and through the hands. And the gloves aren't protecting that individual if they're still touching their face and the, or their nose. So when it comes to the use of uh, rubber gloves and things like that, those may be valuable in very specific situations in which and maybe there's, um, you suspect that there's either equipment that's contaminated or there's materials or tabletops or whatever the case is that's contaminated and you want to give somebody a pair of gloves until they get done cleaning that, then they remove the gloves properly and dispose of them and then wash their hands again. So when we talk about the personal protective equipment, think about what you're doing. You're doing the face masks, you're doing the gloves, Safety glasses um, are, are an important piece of this because a route of entry for COVID is through the eyes. You can get it through the mucus in the eyes. So if you get splashed, if you touch your eyes or whatever the case is, you can transfer the virus into your body by touching your eyes. So if you're speaking with someone, and this is something to remember about distancing and whatnot, if you're speaking with someone or if somebody's yelling across the parking lot to you or if somebody sneezes or coughs or whatever the case is, they are expelling water droplets from their lungs into your face while they're speaking to you or into the area when they're yelling or whatever the case might be every time they do that. So if you're in close proximity, you, know, you want to make sure that you're not getting hit with that and it's not having a route of entry into your body. Um, so 
basically, and it, it gets a little graphic, we don't want spittle hitting us in the face and transferring into our eyes and nose and mouth. So that's where the masks and that's where the, the safety glasses and things like that can be beneficial. So think about that as you're going through your day and look at your job site, look at your situations and say, okay, you ought to be wearing safety glasses on the job site even though we're not doing grinding or whatever the case is. Um, you want to make sure that you're wearing a mask unless it's not necessary or unless we can get, get the distancing right. So think about all those things as you're going through. Um, and keep in mind that the PPE we're talking about is in addition to your normal PPE. So let's keep going through this process and let's talk about um, job site cleaning and disinfecting. And this is, this is something that you know, everybody goes through. We've always tried to keep a clear, clean job. We've always tried to keep um, good hygiene on, on the job if at all possible. But now it's taking another role. Now it's taking to try and prevent the spread of coronavirus on our job site. So first thing you need to do from a cleaning and disinfecting standpoint is personal hygiene. And when we think about personal hygiene, that means when you come to work in the morning, we don't know what you're bringing in with you. We don't know what you've touched. You can stop at Dunkin' Donuts for coffee on the way in and somebody coughed on the cup before giving it to you. You've got that on your hands at this point. So we want to make sure that when people come onto our job site, first thing they do is wash their hands good. And there's plenty of videos and posters and pamphlets and instruction on how to wash your hands. You know, we've all heard the story if you sing happy birthday to yourself a couple times while you're doing it and don't stop watching until you're done with the song, that's gonna be very helpful because then you wash your hands effectively. COVID is susceptible to basic soap and water. So wash, the, wash your hands when you come on the job site and frequently throughout the day. If at all possible, provide hand washing sites throughout the job site or at least um, hand sanitizer throughout the job site so that your employees through the course of the day as they're touching things, coming in contact with things, can sanitize their hands effectively. Um, think about your equipment and tools um, and your vehicles and how you can sanitize those. Or if you're sh slip seating on whether it's a dozer, whether it's an excavator, whether it's a truck, whatever the case may be, if I'm that operator, first thing I do before getting into and starting operations on that vehicle are I'm going to wipe it down uh, because I don't know who was in there last. I don't know what that person has been exposed to over the past 24 hours. Um, so I'm going to wipe that vehicle down. So you'll need supplies to provide for that. Um, clothing um, and whatnot. You know, think about if you do have situations where you find out somebody's infected, you find out somebody's got a problem or, or somebody is potentially infected, what are you going to do as far as what they're wearing and, and what they're leaving around? If they're leaving um, coveralls or jackets or whatever the case may be on site every day, lined up next to everybody else's, there is an opportunity for transfer of bacteria or transfer of viral particles by putting things close together. So think about what you do with things like that. And PPE, make sure that there's opportunity to clean the PPE prior to using it in the day. If you're using safety glasses or whatever the case may be, whether it's a respirator or something along those lines, um, it's very important to clean those periodically, at least at the beginning of the day, at least when you go back after lunch or whatever the case is, to make sure that you've cleaned off any potential exposure on that. When we think about the hygiene aspects of COVID-19, uh, the, the National Institutes of Health, way back in April, actually in March, which seems like years ago, uh, put out a notice of how long the viral particles can stay um, living on different substances. And we look at it and you find out, wow, you know, it, it can live in the air for 20 to 40 minutes if the air is not disturbed or diluted. It can live on hard surfaces for up to three days. So that tabletop in the trailer or the equipment that that person's using, if somebody came through, coughed on it, sneezed on it, or whatever the case is, uh, there may be viral particles on that. And it's just a matter when you talk about the potential for exposure, you look at how many viral particles you take into your body in the course of the day. So if you're taking in one or two, there may not be enough there to start you into the, the whole scheme of coronavirus or COVID-19 disease. 
But if you increase that, if you don't use hygiene practices, if you're speaking to people closely and they're coughing on you, sneezing on you, or you're not taking precautions, you're taking more and more of the virus particles into your system, and that's what sparks the disease. So we're trying to minimize that exposure. So when we talk about um, the job site cleaning and disinfecting, we talk about personal hygiene, we talk about housekeeping um, throughout the site. You know, just regular pickup of the, of the rags and equipment and used gloves and things like that across the site. When somebody sits down and has lunch, you know, they can't leave their wrappers and whatnot around uh, they, they, because they might be carrying uh, potential on them. So we want to make sure that the site is regularly and continuously kept clean of just general things. We also want to look at how you're going through and you're wiping down uh, disinfecting things. So when you're talking about tabletops and equipment, uh, you want to make sure that common areas like the trailer, the lunchroom, the restrooms and whatnot, those get wiped down throughout the course of the day. And keep in mind, each time you write them, wipe them down, you're starting the clock over. So there may be viral particles on that tabletop right now when you come through and wipe it down. At that moment, you've eliminated or minimized the number of viral particles anybody else can be exposed to. However, you've just reset the clock to zero. So throughout the next hour or whatever time period it is, if people come in that do have the virus or have viral particles that they're dispelling, it's going to get on the tabletop. So if you're going to wipe it down in another hour, you've started the clock over there. So think in those terms as we start going through the process of, of uh, disinfecting and cleaning. When we're cleaning, make sure that you use EPA authorized cleaning products. And if you go onto the CDC job or CDC website, you can just search cleaning products for COVID-19 and they'll give you a three page list of products that are um, approved by the EPA that will kill the virus. So you make sure you're using the right ones. And I know that getting some of this stuff is very difficult these days. As we continue to review our elements of the program, we go to response to exposures and potential exposures. What do you do on a job site? What do you do on a job if an employee tests positive, or an employee shows symptoms in the course of the day, or an employee had close contact with a COVID positive person, you know, whether it's at home or whether it's their cousin, uh, whatever the case might be, or what happens if the employee had close contact with a potentially positive person. So what I'd refer you to in that, in the OSHA document, the OSHA guidance document, and this is another one you, you can search online. You can go to www.osha.com or go to the CDC website and just punch in OSHA guidance document. And it'll give you about a 20 page document that goes through what to do relative to COVID-19 and what to do relative to exposures. In addition to that, the, CD, the, the CDC actually puts out a document that says, if you've had an exposure, how long should you quarantine? If you've had a potential exposure, how long should you quarantine? If you've had COVID-19 that you tested positive for, how long should you uh, quarantine before going back to work? So I would recommend you, you grab that document. There's some of it in the handouts that we've given you here today, but grab that document and use that as guidance as you're dealing with your people. Chances are, because there currently is no vaccine, there are no tried and true therapeutics out there that, that stop this virus, chances are in the course of the next year, you will have somebody on your staff that either shows symptoms or tests positive for COVID. So you have to be ready if, if that happens because you don't want that one person to spread it throughout your whole company. So make sure that you review, and these things that might, you've heard of the two week quarantine period, uh, but there's also things like if you were exposed to someone that is potentially affected by COVID-19, but there's no positive test, then you might have a two, three, four, five day quarantine that's followed up by, you know, doing uh, temperature checks and things like that to make sure there's no symptoms and allowing somebody back on the job. But read that CDC document. That's going to help you in that whole area. Now, one of the things that I've been dealing with a lot of late because we deal with a lot of the, the healthcare facilities down in New York City in that area is OSHA record keeping relative to COVID-19. 
Uh, if you look at OSHA record keeping, it's still an important piece. OSHA is enforcing relative to COVID. OSHA has determined or designated COVID-19 as a disease that is a recordable illness on the 300 log based on a work-related exposure. Um, so you have to look at these and you have to say, if somebody on my job site does or on my, in my company does contract COVID-19, how do I record it? Well, the first thing you have to remember is the same rules apply to logging a COVID-19 case as apply to any other injury on your job site. And that's the first thing um, with COVID-19 is it has to be related to a positive test, not diagnosis by a doctor of COVID uh, symptoms or um, consistent with COVID symptoms, but a positive test. That's the trigger for COVID-19 going on a log, or if your employee happens to be hospitalized or uh, in ultimately passes away, um, it's the trigger for reporting to OSHA. And the, the same rules apply for the serious injury reporting that do it for other injuries. If somebody passes away, you have to report to OSHA via their online system or telephone within eight hours of your notification of their passing. Um, if somebody gets admitted to the hospital with this disease, you have to report to OSHA within 24 hours of your being notified of their being admitted to the hospital. So when you're looking at, at COVID-19 um, cases and in your, your company, um, and you're going to decide, A, am I going to report it, or B, am I going to record it on my 300 log? You're going to go through and you have to make some, apply some tests, number one. Is it a COVID positive test? Yes, no. If it's not a positive test or if it's just a diagnosis or if you don't know, then you have not received notification yet. And it doesn't have to go onto the log until you find out it's a positive test. So that's number one. Is it work related? Probably the toughest question to answer on this. My recommendation to you is that if it looks like it very well could be work related or could be work related, then I would record it on your log or if it's necessary, report it to OSHA. The thing you don't want is for OSHA to find out about a case, uh, to come to you and ask, and then you have to defend yourself unknowingly as far as why you didn't put it on your log or why you didn't report it. If you have cases that you look at, you say, I really don't think this is work related, then document your rationale for, for designating that as a non-work related injury. If OSHA does call you up and say, hey, we heard you had a fatality, hey, we heard you had a hospitalization, or if they come in and say, hey, why aren't these cases on the log, you have to have some sort of rationale as why you decided that, and then you can get into defending that position. But definitely look and say, okay, is it COVID positive by test? Is it work-related? And then does it meet the other criteria for um, a work-related exposure to go on the log? Is it lost time? Is it treatment beyond first aid? Is it job transfer? Um, and in some cases, it might not be. If you send somebody home on uh, quarantine and then three weeks later, it's determined that they um, are COVID positive, you, know, you, you might have a situation where they, they stayed at home, they treated at home, they took uh, Advil over the counter, and then now they're gonna come back to work. Uh, so there may not have been treatment beyond first aid. They may have lost time. Uh, but you got to look at all the elements triggering what, what would put it on the log. But you do have to put these things on the log if they are, in fact, work-related and they meet the other criteria. The last thing is privacy of information. Um, in privacy of information, it's the same thing as any other um, privacy case that you'd have on your job site. You can't go out and if uh, Bill Smith tested positive for COVID-19, you can't gather all the guys together and say, hey guys, you know, Bill Smith tested positive for COVID-19 because that's health information and it's protected. What you can do is you can say, hey guys, somebody um, that was on staff here yesterday tested positive for COVID-19, so we recommend that you watch your symptoms. You tell us whether or not you were in close proximity to this individual. You may be called on to answer questions on the tracing investigation on this individual, and please monitor symptoms uh, in yourself to tell us whether or not you're showing any kind of symptoms and we'll deal with that when it comes up. But the privacy part, you do have to protect the privacy of information as um, medical related. 
Um, those are the basic elements of a COVID-19 uh, safety program as it applies to construction. Uh, again, it's not all encompassing. You have to look at it and say, how does this impact us? You may have some other ideas of key elements that need to go in there. Uh, you may have different aspects to your operations. If you have a shop um, that, that you're doing work in, whether it's metal shop or whatever the case is, that you bring in people and you're, you've got folks working in close proximity, you might have a separate set of rules just for them versus those people that are out on the job. If you're working up on steel and you're not near anybody, you know, you can think about the exposure potential there and how you're going to handle that versus working inside a building and running plumbing and heating and, and electrical where you're bumping into each other every 20 minutes. So as you look at your jobs, think about how these elements apply to you and build a program that's going to minimize the exposure that you have and your employees have for contracting COVID-19. Again, this stuff is very, very virulent. It will spread through your organization like wildfire to given half the chance. The, the controls we're putting in place now are something to help block that and protect your employees and keep you on the job, basically. So I hope this has helped. Um, Brett's gonna come back and give some closing thoughts. If you wanna jump in there, Brett. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you very much, Paul. Obviously, a, a lot of great information there, certainly a lot to digest and to retain it all well. And I, I know I'd struggle with that. I, I believe the most important takeaway is that um, you, the listeners, you have resources and materials available as you try to navigate this situation. Uh, if you have any questions and are concerns about the material presented today or in regards to your insurance and risk management program, how it would respond, please do not hesitate to reach out to us via the contact information provided in the materials. Um, we'll also follow up directly with an additional email just to check in on everybody. And again, from One Group's construction team, thank you very much for joining us today. Earl, thank you very much for the opportunity to work alongside the Syracuse Builders Exchange. And Paul, thank you very much for all you do. Uh, everyone, have a great day. Stay safe, happy, and healthy. Thanks again.